In the last few years, the face of Germany has changed a lot. Although Germany was the sick man of Europe ten years ago, today, however, it's become the real economic nerve center of the Eurozone and the main contact for every member of the European Union. While some praise the efficiency of the German model, others criticize the harsh austerity of Chancellor Angela Merkel. Is the German model as efficient as advertised, and would it come to mind to think that Germans might have issues as well? To get an answer, we are headed towards the southern mountains in Bavaria, the largest of the 16 states of Germany. Considered an agricultural region for a long time, Bavaria has become the country's main industrial center over the last 50 years. Today, it's the richest state of Germany. All those foreigners who think any German must look like a Bavarian in traditional dress will not be disappointed by this, even if for the rest of Germany, Bavaria is a world apart. Oh, you want to dance? Here Bavarians don't put on their traditional dress only for the pleasure of tourists. This actually looks like any other Sunday in Untermergau in Upper Bavaria. Neighbors celebrate the happiness of being together and the pride of being Bavarian. Why am I so proud? Because it's my country and we have much to be proud of. It's part of our deep-seated and internal identity. Thank God we have all that. Bavaria, a gift from God? It's probably because Bavarians proudly demonstrate their traditions that the rest of the country is annoyed. However, in the neighboring municipality of Mittenwald, as elsewhere in Bavaria, this does not alter the fact that the inhabitants of this community go all out to celebrate the arrival of summer. I wish you a very good evening with the Orchestra of Mittenwald, conducted by Rupert Bauer. This orchestra has been running for 130 years, and it creates a little nostalgic atmosphere that the inhabitants enjoy. To such a point that people might indulge in unexpected claims. It would be great if we could restore our king. There are still enough descendants of the old dynasty who would be ready to take over the government. Everything would work out well. A kingdom like in the past and everything would be fine. To understand the extravagance of these words, one must be reminded that after its royal period, Bavaria was an ailing agricultural region for a long time. As such, it benefited from a federal redistribution system based on a mutual support between the federal states. Today the rules have been reversed and it's now Bavaria which finally supports the poorest states. There are only three lenders which support the rest of the country. Berlin gets most of the funds but it doesn't contribute much to the common pot. I think we should intervene and say enough, we Bavarians should keep our money in our state and we'll be better off. It's always been like that. They rely on Bavarians because they know we're stupid enough to pay. It must stop now. The lenders who receive our money should manage their finances more wisely. They should stop throwing money down the drain. In our state, nursery schools are expensive. In Berlin, all of that is free. 
a cold anger which can be understood. It's true that in 2012, Bavaria has contributed to the round figure of 3.7 billion euros to other states. Berlin has benefited 3 billion euros out of the 8 billion euros which were redistributed overall. We're always paying for others. When I see the amounts that Cyprus is demanding to the European Union, and Germany is a major sponsor, it just can't be true. Germany should leave the EU and go independent again. Period. Because they have the feeling of being the cash cow of Germany, which itself is the cash cow of the European Union, some Bavarians are exasperated. The Christian Social Union in Bavaria turns this discontent to its advantage. This year, this conservative Bavarian political party even filed a complaint before the Constitutional Court of Karlsruhe to oppose the high tax contribution required in respect of the equalization payments between the regions. Christian Stuckel is a local celebrity. He has recently directed The Passion Play, a world-famous show which has been performed in the region over the last 400 years. Stuckel doesn't deny the excesses of his fellow Bavarians, but he embraces them as well, and that's why he finds a certain charm in this approach. Ultimately, I like Bavarian people a lot, their way of being and even their stubborn attitude. You never get bored with them. They're never indifferent. It's true that they're stubborn sometimes, and it's hard to change their minds. But that's exactly what's fun about it. You spend your time trying to convince them. One thing is certain, though. This observer of Bavarian society can't stand the lack of openness and solidarity of certain people. After participating in a roundtable of the CSU, I realized that their political line consists in arguing with others. They say that Berlin lives off us, that Greece is asking again for money. There's no more sense of solidarity, and this policy is bound to fail. These useless maneuvers only aim at saying that others are bad. But one day, others will understand that we are not beyond reproach. This Bavarian obsession for lecturing others is precisely what is being reproached to Germany and the rest of Europe. No one is a prophet in his own land. Stubborn, exuberant, creative, inefficient. These characteristics are claimed by Bavarians themselves. We're now headed to Baden-Württemberg, the land of Swabians, second stop on this road trip. Swabians have a more discreet dress code than Bavarians, but they are key figures in the country as well. Ingo Dreher is one of these entrepreneurs that shaped the great reputation of these people. We cannot really do everything. That would be an exaggeration. But it's true that Swabians' typical virtues, such as devotion, efficiency and tenacity, help us find solutions where others would have simply given up. Don't be fooled by these appearances of a typical industrial area. We're actually in the second richest state of Germany, the heart of conquering Germany. This is where national champions such as Porsche, Mercedes or Bosch were born. And here Swabians maintain their reputation of entrepreneurs. I don't like cupidity, but frugality is more reasonable. It fosters success. 
Here the key to success holds in one word, Mittelstand, referring to the small and medium-sized businesses which boost competitiveness and create so many jobs. Ingo's company manufactures precision metal parts for the automobile industry and the rail transport. Ingo started on his own 15 years ago. And today, almost 20% of his production is designed for export towards Brazil, Switzerland and the United States. I have 16 employees who relay each other 24 hours a day from Monday morning at 6 a.m. to Saturday at 10 p.m. Despite the economic crisis, Ingo has doubled the number of his employees over the last five years, and he's proud to be part of this Mittelstand, which is the heart of the German economy. Yes, I'm convinced that the large industrial groups benefit from the expertise of small businesses like us. All the innovation in our sector, the tool industry and the high technology comes from small businesses of the Mittelstand. The leading brands never invest in this kind of innovation. But when they buy our products, they get good quality products for a cheap price. The sign of this success in Germany is that 99% of the businesses are small and medium-sized businesses. And it works out well. But the case of Baden-Württemberg is remarkable for other reasons. Although it's a traditionally conservative state, it's the only state in Germany with a Green Party governor. Although Ingo is a member of the CDU, he voted for that Green candidate at the last elections. So why the new shift? Because in these last few years, I strongly disagreed with the CDU, both at a federal level and at a state level. But now I'm very happy with our new minister president. He's a conservative, attached to his traditions and to his re region. And at the same time, he has real environmental beliefs. And I think that's great. No, Greens are no dreamers here. It's rather those who continue destroying nature that no longer have a majority in our region. I don't see why it would be a paradox to work in the automobile industry and to advance the environmental cause at the same time. The automobile industry is certainly the fastest growing sector in terms of sustainable development. We shouldn't forget that, and we're working for that purpose. For Ingo, like for a growing number of Germans, this partnership of the right wing with environmental groups is no longer taboo. In Germany, the Green Movement has no longer been the political monopoly of the left for a long time. Here's some evidence in Stuttgart, with this demonstration near Central Station. I think that this movement shows that our republic suffers from a serious disease, caused by its arrogance and its ignorance. And this cancer really threatens the existence of our democracy. Over the last three years, demonstrators have been gathering every Monday to protest against the construction of a new international rail station. It might seem trivial compared to the mass demonstrations against the crisis which regularly agitate France and southern European countries, for example. Yet Germany has experienced mass demonstrations in the past, but the tone today is different. Before I thought that those who were in the high spheres of power knew what they were doing, that we could trust them, and everyone did their job properly. But it's actually not the case at all. So today I've become a much more vigilant and critical citizen. Bernard and Monica are members of the Angry Citizen Movement which has gained momentum in the last few years in Germany. The hardcore members are no longer that young, and they rather mobilize the upper middle classes. 
These citizens have become street protesters in later life. Yet they're determined to win their case, but not so as to come to clashes with the police force. Are you getting tired of this protest? Of course not. Do I look tired? No, there's no problem. We're getting used to it. This will be the 175th Monday demonstration. It's fun to watch, especially when there's no crowd disorder like today. Yet, these special units don't always keep their calm. Three years ago, on September 30th, 2010, the demonstration around the rail station went wrong. In this rather quiet region, it was unprecedented. A thousand and seven hundred policemen were there to beat us, firing tear gas, water cannons, and we were victims of police brutality. Dietrich Wagner was there that day. His sight was very heavily impaired following the injuries caused by water cannons. Since then, he's become the symbol of this struggle against the government's arbitrary decisions. I didn't think that such a state crime was possible in a European democracy. It's really incredible. We were only peaceful demonstrators. The struggle of angry Swabians seems to be on the wrong track. Despite a budget overspending of 2 billion euros, Merkel's government has maintained the construction of the rail station. And during the referendum of 2011, the population voted in favor of the rail project. Yet today the upper middle classes and the retired people take more often to the streets and challenge the authorities. After the Stuttgart station, there came the new Berlin airport project and the construction of high voltage power lines. Each time a project annoys its citizens, the government must now face mass demonstrations. We now leave the country south to go to another state in eastern Germany, called Thuringia. We are headed precisely to Suhl, a remote corner of Germany. Located on the heights of the city, this is the Ringberg Hotel. This is where Nareda works. She's 26 years old. She comes from Malaga. She arrived in Thuringia only two months ago. After taking on a series of underpaid jobs in Spain, Nareda tried her luck here, for better or for worse. The beginnings were difficult, but she was never discouraged. I'd like to speak German fluently in order to hold another job. With a start at the reception desk, I might become a hotel manager one day. Why do you have to start from there? Because you must always start from the bottom of the ladder to become a good hotel manager. Even if she only earns a monthly gross wage of 1,250 euros for the moment, Nereida plans to stay in Germany and settle here for good. In 2012, more than one million foreigners like Nereida came to Germany hoping for a better future. A few months ago, the Chamber of Commerce of Seoul launched a recruitment campaign in Spain. With no job prospects, Ruben and Christian jumped at the opportunity. They've been here for a few weeks now. <laughs> Ruben and his friends are rather young. They are electricians, fitters or designers. 
sign of the gap between the declining southern European countries and the fast-growing northern European countries, this Spanish generation stricken by unemployment came here to try their luck. They found jobs, but they lost their lifestyle. Do we miss Spain? Of course we do. Actually, I expected something else. I expected some atmosphere similar to Spain where people are in the streets and where salaries are higher. And then I actually realized that in the streets everything closes at 7 p.m. I thought there would be a nightlife like in Spain. At the age of 23, the daily routine of commuting, shopping, fixing dinner, then going to sleep, nah. I must say, I'm not having an amazing time. There's no social life. The only thing that matters is work. Work, eat, and sleep. That's all there is to it. When I tell this to my friends in Spain, I tell them, in Germany you live to work, in Spain you work to live. I didn't understand that here things can only be done one way, and you can't change that, period. There's no question about that. You can't bring new ideas. When you suggest something different, the answer is always no. In the end, you do as you're told. That's it, and there's nothing to argue. At the same time, this must be the secret of German success. If the system has weaknesses, it also has advantages which have not escaped the attention of newcomers. Everyone does their part. Whether you're a sweeper or a politician, each one does their task, each one is responsible. Here the country is moving forward, and everyone goes with the flow. That includes the government, the world of work. Everyone is moving forward together in the same direction. The processes are different and more complex, and with more bureaucratic rules, but in the end it works out very well. For all these immigrants who feel betrayed by their politicians, Germany is the example of a rigid system, but a working system. In return, Germany needs these immigrants today to make that system work. Germany is actually facing a huge problem. The population is aging very fast, and there's a lack of workforce. In the near future, it could be one of its biggest challenges. Simone lives a few kilometers from Seoul. She's 44 years old and has two grown children. Recently divorced, she's struggling to make ends meet. She welcomes us into her small two-room apartment that she rents from a house basement. And when we tell her that migrant workers arrived in the nearby city, Simone finds it hard to understand how this could be good news for her. The emergence of this new workforce, we don't really like that. First of all, young German workers don't earn much because the newcomers already work for lower wages. In the companies, there is increasing pressure on us. And we're told, for example, if you go on sick leave too often and can't work, many are waiting to take over your jobs. Simone is constantly on the defensive. She reflects the widespread feeling of those who live in a precarious situation. Simone works in a factory. Once she's paid her monthly rent and bills, she only has 150 euros left. I didn't think I could fall so low. I never thought it would be so complicated to go out and see some friends. A new bar opens in town, friends call me and say come with us, but I can't afford it. So I find excuses to hide the fact that I don't have enough money. 
Es kann nicht so sein, dass wir It can be possible to earn such low wages. On top of it, tighten our belts just to see Germans succeed. I think we're getting closer to the American model where we'll have to accept running two or three jobs to keep our heads above water. Simone is bitter, just like those who have the feeling they've been left behind by a country which is moving forward without taking care of her own, the underprivileged and the lower class. She blames Germany for sacrificing people like her on the altar of growth and prosperity. From abroad it's a nice picture, but if you take a closer look, it's just a facade. Germany gives the impression of a world power because it gives money to everyone. She's always the first country to help others financially. Germany is rich, it's all good at home. But immigrants who come to Germany can see that our wages are too low. Simone sincerely hopes for the creation of a minimum wage established by law. The Social Democrats made a promise, Merkel is considering it now. Meanwhile, a quarter of German workers earn a salary lower than the French minimum wage set at 9.40 euros an hour. A complete change of scene now. We're driving towards North Rhine, Westphalia, headed to Paderborn. In Paderborn, we meet with Marius Potting, a creative farmer. In the beginning, everyone was making fun of us. They even called us crazies. When we made our first solar panel, it was a revolution in the region. But today, those who were laughing at us now have solar panels on their roof. Marius Potting is one of the pioneers of the region in terms of renewable energy. Marius started out as a farmer and then he got into solar energy 15 years ago. What started out as a pure commitment to the environment then proved to be a lucrative business. Marius still practices livestock farming, but the production of electricity became a very profitable business. The production and the marketing of energy represent a large part of our revenues. Thanks to that, we can keep on developing our agricultural production. Marius sells his electricity to large corporations and makes the round figure of 5,000 euros a month, a rewarding industry for all those farmers transformed into businessmen. We play an active role in the production of energy and thanks to our large rooftop surface we can provide power to 60 homes. We're very proud of it. Thanks to subsidies from the federal government, 50% of the production of renewable energy is already carried out by individuals and farmers. But Marius is not satisfied with that alone. That's why he invested in his own windmill in order to become independent from the large corporations. This is the smallest windmill in the area, but we are the only farmers who invested in wind energy production. Over the last year and a half, Marius has been selling his wind energy directly to a power exchange. The advantage is that we are completely independent from the major energy groups. We're in direct competition with the other producers. It's nice not to depend on public subsidies. And we sell at a more profitable price to the power exchange than if we were to go through conventional intermediaries. Mario's choice was strongly encouraged by the decision taken by Angela Merkel to get out of nuclear power and switch to a renewable energy supply. In the long term, this choice will have consequences on the environment. Windmills like this one can now be seen everywhere in Germany. Just like these power lines. And it's only the beginning. 
but it's probably the price to pay for clean energy. So is the democratization of energy production on its way in Germany? But this will be some time before it becomes reality, as it is evidenced by this steel monster located just 100 kilometers from Marius farm. If 23% of electricity consumption is assured by renewable energies, Germany still produces 45% of its electricity thanks to coal power stations. It's cheaper, but more polluting. While we're waiting for the benefits of the Green Revolution, this monster keeps digging deeply into the earth to extract its daily 200,000 tons of lignite. With its four lignite-fired power plants, the Rhine Valley is the source of pollution with the highest CO2 emissions in Europe. We now understand better why the government said that the energy transition was the biggest challenge that Germany has to take on since its reunification. Heading to the north of Low Saxony, we run into the Elbe River. Until 1989, this river was a natural border between West Germany and East Germany. There used to be a wall between both countries. Now there's a river which plays a similar symbolic role. Hello. Can we cross the river from here? In principle, yes, but not today. The basin is undergoing maintenance. In the middle of the Cold War, East Germans would wait for the winter or would swim across the river risking their lives to flee to the west. Following the enthusiasm of the reunification, the idea of constructing a bridge came up to bring together both parts of Low Saxony. But 20 years later, nothing has been done. This bridge would cross the Elbe at this point, and we would have a large concrete arch over the river that's 35 meter high. You can imagine all the cars with their bright lights racing through the night. Once the enthusiasm for reunification faded away, the habitual behaviors resumed. On this west side of the river, Uli Stang is strongly opposed to the bridge project. According to him, it would threaten this site, classified as a biosphere reserved by the UNESCO. Some say that the reunification will only be achieved once the bridge is built. But boats already bring us together. It doesn't depend on their bridge. Psychologically, the situation is very complicated. And I understand it's a problem, but I can't accept that if I want to protect our nature. What do people think on the other side of the Elbe River? These people were cut off from their native region, and they still feel cut off 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. In order to cross to the other side, which is just 300 meters away, we have to make a detour of 20 kilometers before finding the only boat which ferries people from one bank to the other. Once on the other side, we find first that the remains of East Germany are still present. We meet with the Niederhofs. A family of farmers cut off from Low Saxony for 40 years and very attached to their region. In East Germany you couldn't sing that. The Niederhof have long waited for that promise to put an end to their isolation, but today they've lost faith in it. 
Yes, we feel kind of abandoned. Little by little, they are forgetting about us. For 20 years, they made us believe that that bridge would be built. Yes, it's been too long. We should have built it right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The economy of the region is declining. Workers are leaving. They can't stay because the cost of the Basin preservation is too high, and jobs are found on the other side of the river, to the west. So, faced with this situation, the city council has intervened. On the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the reintegration of their community to Low Saxony, local officials have organized a party to lobby their citizens. This slogan, Bridges for Stronger Ties, I love it. I think it's great. I also think it's great. I like its double meanings. It's pretty good. Two messages conveyed in one phrase. The reunification process will only be achieved with the construction of this bridge. This reunification will only get real for locals from that moment. It will be a happy ending. The inhabitants of Amt Neuhaus are not going to see their dreams realized overnight. To the objections of conservationists, one must add the construction costs, which amount to 48 million euros. Consequently, Low Saxony has cautiously distanced itself from the project. The legacy of East Germany can sometimes prove to be good. Daniela is 32 years old. She's the mother of two children who are five and nine years old. She works as a nurse at the hospital in Hamburg, 60 kilometers from here. If she achieves the perfect balance between her family and personal life, it's a little bit thanks to East Germany. Here for all the parents at work who are looking for a place in a child care center, there's no problem to find one. Day nurseries for everyone in Germany. It's quite exceptional. In the West, people are used to seeing the mother stay at home to take care of the children. As a result, the regions of East Germany, which have inherited from the nursery school system put in place during the Soviet era, are still ahead of the rest of the country to this day. For me, it was normal to place my daughter at the day nursery from the age of one. And I immediately found a place. In Hamburg, it's different. In Lüneburg, it's not easy as well. Their child care centers are open until 1 p.m. But then what are parents supposed to do with their children after 1 p.m.? For us, women raised in East Germany, it's a little easier to resume work after pregnancy. We're used to it thanks to our education. Our mothers would resume work quickly. I can imagine that women in West Germany were raised on different standards. Their mothers stayed longer at home, and they probably think that this education standard is better. Anyway, for us it's easier today. At the hit parade of the East German legacy, a symbol raised in the German Democratic Republic, a woman like them who came a long way. Madame Merkel is an example, an inspiration for all women. She's the symbol of a successful woman, and that's not thanks to par parity or quotas meant to hire people from East Germany, if you know what I mean. She succeeded thanks to her hard work and determination. You know, in museums there are standard meters. Well, I think our Chancellor does such a good work that she should serve as a reference. We should keep her in a museum and display her as a standard measure for government. A standard measure for government? Maybe. But to be kept in a museum? Angela Merkel will not necessarily appreciate the compliment. As we're driving further to the east, we arrive in Berlin, the capital. 
a high place for young people and artists from all over the world. Before being the political center of Germany, Berlin is most of all the hippest European city of the time. Freedom of speech, places of artistic creation, nightclubs in great numbers. On top of it, it's one of the cheapest city of Germany. In these conditions, it's no wonder Berlin attracts so many young people. Tim Teller settled here 15 years ago. In 2009, he founded with his friend Alex the first independent electronic music radio station of the city called BLN-FM. In the kitchen, which also serves as an office, the conversation quickly revolves around the Berlin paradox. It's true, Berlin is the capital of party-goers, but are Germans happy about that? What's the purpose of it? Why are you giving me this look? But don't you think it's better to see Berlin as a cool city with a huge potential for creativity, rather than just a concrete monster falling into ruin? But it's just an illusion. Or like some poor city with a high unemployment rate? But Berlin is a poor city. It may be poor, but it's sexy, and that's the magic. I'm against this image. Berlin should not be a city where tourists travel in low-cost companies just to come partying and end up throwing up against the wall, then take a few pictures and fly home. Yeah, in your dreams. Actually, tourism remains one of the most important source of revenues for the city. Because it was divided by the wall for a long time and landlocked in the middle of East Germany, Berlin has never been able to develop an industry. Today it has one of the highest unemployment rate in the country and its debts amount to 62 billion euros. In a way we could say that Bavarians are funding the country's showcase, which is Berlin itself. And of course, they're wondering if the money for that showcase is wisely spent. But I think Bavarians should be happy with what Berlin has to show. I have the feeling Berlin gives the impression abroad of a cosmopolitan, open-minded and cool Germany. The same cannot be said of certain rural areas of Germany. But it would also work without the Bavarians' money. And even if we didn't have Berlin, saying that Germany is a sullen and mean-spirited country, that's plain bullshit. Yes, but nevertheless, from abroad you always look at what's going on in the capital. And whether you like it or not, Berlin is the capital. Berlin has that wonderful mix. It's the capital of a country famous for its austerity chancellor who wants to impose strict rules to the entire Eurozone and who is hated for that. And at the same time, Berlin is a cosmopolitan and creative city which parties all night long. Berlin provides Germany with a showcase which allows to shed its rigid image. What's my wish for Germany? I'd like people to live in harmony and peace and without prejudice. That's my goal. Aydin Akin arrived from Turkey 45 years ago. He's an accountant. He rides 40 kilometers a day on his bike. He presses his demands for a cosmopolitan Germany.
die Menschen, die äh, ausgegrenzt sind. If you exclude foreigners from the political life, they'll never love Germany. The fact is that they are excluded. They have the same duties, but they don't have the same rights. Germany should solve that issue. That's why I'm asking for the right of all immigrants to vote at the local elections and the end of the visa policy and the establishment of dual citizenship. As long as these three conditions aren't met, I'll keep protesting on my bike. A debate inside the Bundestag, a rare debate in Europe. The members of Parliament are examining the request from Social Democrats to ban a party which has scored only 1.8 percent at the last general elections. Democracy can't be threatened with such a low score. Yet, they're dealing with a far-right party which is openly nostalgic for the Third Reich. The NPD. Für die SPD-Fraktion hat jetzt das Wort der Kollege Michael Hartmann. Es gibt im Grundsatzprogramm der NPD ein Kapitel mit der Überschrift Integration ist Völkermord. In diesem Kapitel wird gefordert, dass die deutsche Volkssubstanz zu erhalten ist. Was brauchen Sie noch, um zu sagen, diese Partei muss verboten werden, meine Damen und Herren? Wir leben in einem Land, das aufgebaut ist aus, auf dem nie wieder gegenüber der nationalsozialistischen Tyrannei. Und insofern ist es ein Gebot der Staatsräson, diese Partei verbieten zu lassen durch das Verfassungsgericht. Für die FDP-Fraktion hat der Kollege Hartmut Wolf das Wort. Zur wehrhaften Demokratie gehört auch ein Parteiverbot. Aber man muss sich schon die Frage stellen, ob man mit einem Verbot nicht einfach nur eine Hülle beseitigt, das Grundproblem aber weiter bestehen bleibt. Schafft jetzt ein Verbotsverfahren nicht unnötige Aufmerksamkeit für eine Partei, die in ihrer Mitgliederentwicklung und ihren Finanzen ohnehin am Boden liegt? Aber glauben Sie nicht, dass ein Verbot der NPD eine wichtige Hemmschwelle in unserer Gesellschaft setzt und zugleich dem Ausland signalisiert, wir lassen in Deutschland das Überschreiten einer bestimmten Grenze bei Rassismus, Antisemitismus und Ausländerfeindlichkeit nicht zu? Und wäre das nicht wichtig, dieses Signal zu setzen? On that day, the parties in power, the CDU and the Liberal Party, voted against the motion to ban the NPD. The Bundesrat, the Federal Council, which represents the 16 federal states, will alone submit the case to the Constitutional Court of Karlsruhe. However, one must be reminded that Germany is one of the rare European countries which hasn't been swayed by populism. While extremist parties make alarming scores in other European countries, Germany seems to be spared for the moment. Isn't this the greatest political victory of contemporary Germany?